Okay, one last time, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for staying till the end. Um, I really think it's going to be worth your while with the, with the last panel that we have uh, put together here for you today. Um, the format, we're going to have mainly a Q&A discussion, um, although if we're going to have uh, Roberto Egling from, from Volkswagen kick us off with a, a presentation looking at the future and, uh, and some, some thought starters effectively that will help kind of facilitate our, our discussion here. Um, but again, thank you for, for staying here to the end. I think we've, you can see for yourself we've got a, a, a diverse and dynamic uh, group here. Maybe dynamics giving them too much credit, but nevertheless, it's, a, it's a, certainly a, um, a, an interesting mix of, 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 of experts here uh, that we've been fortunate enough to, uh, to join us. Let me introduce them to you as a start, and then we'll start rolling in. As I mentioned, we're first going to hear from Roberto Egeling, who's a director of logistics for Volkswagen Group of America, based in Chattanooga, for the production here in the US. Um, double building for Volkswagen. You've, uh, most of you who were here earlier would have already uh, perhaps met and seen Anu Go, who's the, who's the head of the, the services um, uh, department at the for Volkswagen Group of America. Uh, this is a department looking over spare parts and finished vehicle sides. So between the two of them, we've got the whole supply chain for Volkswagen Group of America pretty much in hand here. We're making Dana work for his ticket today, so uh, joining us right again, back on stage again from last session, Dana McBrien, uh, Associate Chief Advisor from Honda North America. Um, and maybe the baseball bat, is it hiding behind the chair? I don't know, we'll see. Um, and we're also very pleased to welcome, now for the first time, to, to the stage of this conference, uh, Benoit Montreuil, who's the leader of Supply Chain and Logistics Institute at Georgia Tech, and really one of the leading thinkers um, in, in, in this space. So very excited to be able to get his perspective. And the guy over there with the, with the very innovative haircut <laughs> is, uh, is, of course, Louis Yakumi. It's a two-for-one deal. It's also so that we can prove that we're not actually the same person. I know I had a few people saying they couldn't really tell over. <laughs> So I, I think you know this conference has been uh, really enjoyable for me. Really interesting. I, I think in, in some way, there's been some areas where it might feel more like almost like a human resources conference. We've talked a lot about talent. We've talked a lot about developing that, and it's come up again and again. Uh, we've talked a lot about innovation and, and change management, cultural changes. Um, we've had perhaps less talk about you know LTL freight or returnable packaging or engineering. And uh, I mean we've had some, and obviously that's great, and that's what we do. But you know a little bit the point of this conference as well as seeing what's happening in the, in the, in the day-to-day on the ground, is to take that step back and, and, and to kind of reflect on, on the changes. I don't need to list again everything that, that we've heard about connectivity, autonomy, aut autonomous driving, the sensor-based um, um, you know, IoT connectivity, which is coming in, um, machine learning, all of these things which, which are, are, are really being discussed, perhaps in some cases discussed more than, more than used, at least in the logistics space, but, but you know, they're heading our way, and I think there's um, many messages about not being the Kodaks of this industry um, over the next three, four, five years. But obviously there's many challenges here. There's hype as well as sort of potential. So which way do you go with some of this? It's not always easy uh, to make those decisions. But I hope by coming together at this conference, which is in a way also designed to be a bit more intimate, a bit smaller than perhaps some of the other events that, that we do at Automotive Logistics or that perhaps you, you go to at large affairs and stuff, is you know, to get a chance to, to, to talk uh, through some of those things, take that step back. So that's why I'm pleased to, to bring Roberto up to the stage now, uh, again, to kind of kick us off uh, with a look at some of what the future of, uh, of, of automotive logistics will be looking like for Volkswagen. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, why I'm presenting now some, some documents, the reason is I was thinking during the weekend what kind of tricky questions Louis can make me. <laughs> to be prepared is that I present some, it's only five pages, and it's, a, let me say, a summary of my experience. I now, since uh, 35 years in logistics, I never, I was entering in logistics. I'm an industrial engineer, and I don't know why I enter in logistics, and in the meantime, and even after 35 years, I have a lot of fun in being in logistics. Uh, working in different countries, uh, starting in logistics in Germany, jumping to Spain, after then again Germany, again Argentina, Portugal, Spain, and now since two years here in Chattanooga. Um, 
My, my experience, what I, what I was living in logistic was we had a certain first revolution or a first wave that influenced my, my job was the introduction of the EDI in the 90s. Uh, this, uh, I was very, very deep involved in this. And it was a time at, in Spain and we start to uh, send information to the suppliers. And with this big step, we could reduce a lot of uh, stocks increasing information. Uh, we were using a, a technology that at this time was, let me say, invented, and we were making money with. Uh, second wife, in the meantime, we had issues related to environmental, CO2, uh, ergonomics, globalizations that affected my, my job. Uh, we start to bring parts from worldwide. Um, and now, I see uh, uh, I'm living the last, let me say, the last years, a new uh, big wave, a step, that are new technologies that we can use in, in logistics. Uh, this, this last symbol is a, is a tool, but um, I have to remember all is for save money. Yeah? Uh, I would, when I was preparing this, my colleague said, yeah, you, can, you have to put productivity. Yeah? Productivity is money. Uh, better service. It's money. At the end, this is what we are looking in, in logistics. Sorry, I'm, I'm all, for me, it's very simple. We are fighting for money, and we are using tools, tools that are being invented that we have to adapt to our needs. In, uh, in Chattanooga, we are doing something. In Spain, it, it was a it was long time there, and we were using um, things that we were copying from, from others. For example, there is a... Um, we named this in German Falkenauge. It's a system where you see with cameras in the in the tennis uh, games, you can see where exactly the ball is. We use this technology with these cameras to uh, test the the containers where we had the, the the metal parts that are being picked by robots. And it's very critical if the parts are not exactly in the right position. This is why we're using these technologies. And this is the way. At the same time, we were inventing um, some systems there uh, with absolutely no technology. So every time looking to try to reduce uh, costs. Um, this picture shows maybe during the times the different uh, complexity. If you see on the, on the vertical, there is a technology complexity, yeah, a fax was easy after then EDI, and you can see the different issues that now we are, we are having in the, in the market. Uh, here we can see the names, so we are talking about fax, EDI, internet, RFID that we can use, 3D printing, all this was, was uh, presented yesterday, today is nothing new, absolutely nothing new. 3D vision, virtual planning and training to train the people, artificial intelligence, man-machine collaboration, robots working together with, with people, different robots, not the old one that we need. Uh, we, we can use the augmented reality. We are using GPS for guided navigation with no, no people in, autonomous navigation in, and outside of our buildings, uh, we can talk about, we can use, or we will use, or we have to see how to use cloud computing, swarm intelligence, uh, and all this, what also was presented here as Industry 4.7, yeah? So for me, um, if someone asks me, what's the picture about logistic future? I don't know, here I can make a picture for 2020 maybe, but I don't know what will happen 2030. No? But I hope that we in logistics, yeah, really, yeah. It's, it's I don't know, and, and this is, technology-wise, is, is going in a, in a speed that we will never, um, or oh, I cannot now know in which direction this will be or how, how, how complex this will be. And, um, but as I said, I think, um, I'm having a lot of fun being in logistics and uh, trying to use the technology. And as I said, it's all for uh, reduce the cost, yeah, and to be uh, giving a better a better service to my client, for example, for after sales part two. 
Yeah? And this is mainly what I want to say. It's a big wave now coming, a bigger one, a tsunami. I don't know what will happen. But uh, we have to, to use this like the surfer does to try to have fun surfing the big wave. Yeah? So and this is what I was presenting. Maybe can be used as introduction. Thank you, thank you, Roberto, and, and, and that sort of echoed a little bit when we heard from Gartner yesterday and, and Scott DeWicky when he just said, "None of us know, of course. <laughs> and then, who the hell, who the hell does know?" Um, but we obviously we see some of the stuff that's coming down the path, and, and, and we know we need to focus on innovation and change. Um, I guess we can start start with the same uh, start with the panel. I mean, we can perhaps let's go straight to, to Benoit um, since you're joining us on, on stage for the first time today. Um, you know, last year at this conference, I remember you presenting about uh, the potential for shared collaborative networks. You know, this concept, if you look at the Southeast for automotive, it's just kind of obvious. It's, it, people largely have similar footprints, but they're not, not sort of sharing. So, I mean, do you, do you see how, how much of this vision or reality are you kind of see as becoming, going from potential to reality? You know, and, and, and perhaps you can talk about that. Okay. Um, it's clear that from our perspective, we see the technology evolving quite a lot. But at the same time, we see the expectations from customers uh, expanding also quite a lot in terms of customization, in terms of speed, uh, price also. Uh, we see this movement into mobility as a service that is growing also. So when you put it all together, so we have a pool from customers that, that is tremendously changing the game. And, uh, and then we see also the industry, is, the industry, the ecosystem is, is changing with, uh, uh, it used in North America, it used mostly to be centralized around Detroit. But now it, there's kind of a, this line that starts around Detroit, goes all the way down south and uh, near Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, and then, and then you see a twist uh, and go into Mexico, and, and then there's this curve, and you see suppliers by the hundreds along, the, along that, that, big, that big alley, and, and you see more and more uh, of, the, uh, of the car assemblers, okay, that uh, either install themselves in Mexico, southern, uh, south, southeast of the U.S., and, and many in between. We've got Tesla in the west, but, but most of the rest is, is along those lines. Uh, as we study it, we see that there is, there is a lot of good practice, a lot of integration of technologies, but the big hurdle that we see is that most are doing it solo or just with one or two partners that they're, they're playing with, or they'll have nice relationship between a given supplier and a given assembler okay, and, and, and play the game there. But, but then you see a lot of pressure all around, okay, to uh, either have a frequency of delivery that's going to be slower than what you would like to, or you have trucks or trailers or containers that are much slower, much less filled than, than necessary. So all this is, is creating a system that when you look at it overall, is, is not functioning, okay? It's, it's, it doesn't appear to us I, as being sustainable. And then I'm, I've looked at the US, okay, but uh, if you go with Europe, okay, we've got several companies that come from, from Germany here, uh, but they're not collaborating getting the, the parts into North America. It's, so you see a lot of them, each one is trying their best, but overall, again, we've got this still, still trouble. So, so what we're working as concepts is in, in getting the solutions driven and starting to work with the companies in the field is how do we begin to get them to think about, about this? And the goal is to get, uh, get number of companies together in, in like a Georgia Tech being like a neutral place, help them look at the data, do the simulations, do the, the engineering of how this can be working and, and prove that makes sense, then go into pilots and, and test this stuff as it's going. Now, w uh, 
Am I telling that in, in automotive this is up and running? We've got this physical internet of, uh, of, uh, of automotive. I say, no, we're not there. Uh, but w what is fun is that we see uh, much more companies coming and talk to us, starting projects, like uh, we're working right now with Daimler, Mercedes, and it started with uh, looking at how they would uh, deploy and plan their, the logistics facilities surrounding the assembly lines. Uh, but now it's growing and, and looking looking at all the inbound logistics into it, and with a plan to go into looking at uh, interconnecting uh, all this. So, so we see it there. What is very interesting is what we see going on in other industries, uh, like in the consumer goods industry. So it used to, I used to be taught as a daydreamer or a utopist, uh, but now you've got companies like, small companies like uh, 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 Amazon, Okay, that have installed over 100 and something fulfillment center across North America, that was phase one, okay? For their own purpose, the stuff they buy, they're gonna sell on Amazon. Now phase two, okay, what they, do, what they did is open this to all their suppliers that sell on Amazon. So that's phase two. But now you've got to understand how Amazon makes the most money now. It makes most money on the cloud with its cloud storage, cloud computing. So they learn exactly like I've been telling for 10 years, okay? And they use the metaphor and they say, hey, let's do cloud storage, cloud fulfillment, but for real products. So now you can sell on anywhere you want. You can use fulfillment assets from, from Amazon, okay? And use it like you do, do cloud storage. So if you're a, a small company, you can can deploy in over 100 different fulfillment centers uh, across North America, and, and you just serve very fast, which was not in the case. So you've got companies like Flex.com, CRC Services in France, and you, you could keep naming uh, the, the company that just won the best uh, uh, North American Innovation Award, okay, Convertible Concepts which is basically along the lines that we've been talking. Company concept is very simple. Your trailers that get out the plants, they're full of cars, then you go into the dealerships and empty them. And then what do they do there in Minneapolis, okay? Now they have to go back to your plant empty. Now they said, well, can we convert this and bring something back, okay? And can we use modular containers so that we can play this game back at both sides? Now, this is physical internet type of concepts. It starts small, but those are starts that are in this industry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And that's a, a good point there, because we've been talking a lot about the technology, uh, and that's how, how that's going to impact uh, the automotive or supply chain industries, but uh, innovation doesn't have to be doesn't have to be uh, computer technology. It can be uh, hardware technology as well. So, just a, a, a general kind of question to to the audience, uh, to the panel rather. We focused a lot, perhaps, in the conference on the you know digitalization industry 4.0. But are you seeing, uh, are you looking at uh, hardware uh, technology that, that can shape things? Is it? And it's just, you know, it, uh, it's just something that occurred to me because we focus so much on that. And you're right, convertible trailers is an example of something which was a simple idea. Are we trying too hard to find crazy ideas or, <laughs> you know, using the technology as opposed to sometimes thinking simply? Is, the, is some of the best on innovation much simpler? Uh, and are we, are we still looking for those? Are we finding those? Can I ask the panel if there's been examples of that that you've seen recently or are looking at where the, the innovation isn't just uh, digital or computerized? If I may on this, okay, very short. It, I, I applaud all the innovation from technology perspective. Mm -hmm. We're exploiting the predictive, the analytics, mm -hmm. we're, we're exploiting the IoT stuff, we're exploiting the new capabilities that Industry 4.0 is trying to, mm -hmm. to get in there. But if you just are picking technologies with no vision as a system of where you're going, you're going to go this way, this way, crossing the other way, and all that. It's going to be crazy, and you don't get anywhere. The, 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 the composite of this will be a zero gain. Okay? While if you think where you want to go and where you can really have impact in the field, okay, then you, go, you say, okay, with all the technologies we have now, how can we best go in that direction? And, and the direction is influenced also by the technologies we have. But we're really at Georgia Tech pushing it so that you have to think system, meta system, and like we talk, cyber physics, 
physical system? Well, think it on a grand scale. That's what we need as thinking. Otherwise, it's just little pieces in there, there. Yeah, if I, if I can add, that's a, that's a really good point. And it's been brought up a couple times during the conference that um, if, you're going to, if you're going to introduce technology, you want technology to be addressing a, a problem. Mm -hmm. And even uh, leave hardware out of it. Uh, a lot of times uh, during development over the years, the best development of systems have come from the first development of a, bit of a process. Once you understand the process, then it's easier. You apply the process to fix an issue, then you apply the, the solutions or the technology to fix or improve the process. And it, it sometimes is getting back to the basics. I guess I'm sounding like the guy with all the gray hair up here, but um, <laughs> sometimes it's getting back to the basics and doing the blocking and tackling yeah. um, that you, you wind up getting to the solution eventually. And sometimes it's not, sometimes it is hardware, sometimes you stay with the, the process, and sometimes you deploy the, the technology. Um, just a, a couple of random thoughts. Um, the previous panel that was up here, the question I wanted to ask, we didn't get a chance to really ask it, was when you look at the Volkswagen Group performance review process, first half of it is performance to objectives. Do you deliver results, right? We got metrics, you can go through it. Right. Extenuating circumstances, et cetera. What I always look for is did you anticipate a problem or mitigate a risk, mm -hmm. right? Okay. The second half of it is leadership competencies. And the number four or five thing out of eight or nine leadership competencies is innovation. I, Take a 30-year-old or 30-year logistics veteran and have them rate somebody on their innovation. Are you friggin' kidding me? <laughs> right? I, so people think of innovation as this, so the IT stuff we're talking about, technology. Oh, yep. uh, that's the IT department's job. Right? Now, if you leave it to IT, you're going to get an IT solution that doesn't solve the problem you want. You're going to be working, this is what the system does, and you're gonna end up with something that's not what you were looking for, but it's better than what you had, okay. right? All right, so then you get the IT solution and you say, hey, wow, let's customize it. Like, go take an SAP product and go customize it. What's that gonna cost you? All right, then the, the manual maintenance of stuff. And you start looking <coughs> at it and you have a chat with SAP and they go, this, we have 1,800 companies using this product in 300 industries, why are you different? <laughs> well, because. <laughs> Right? And then you go through it. So what I try to get to with the team, so now you were asking for some examples, I'm going to try, to try to bring it all back. To me, the best innovations are incremental innovations. If someone's got a great, better idea like Apple or something great, then you're working in the wrong industry and right, go make your billions of dollars. How, to me, innovation is making what we do better every day. Mm -hmm. So if you take a look at some of the things we do, I, I've got a part, I don't have it. Okay. So is you don't have that subcomponent, it's gonna be three months flying it over from Germany, et cetera. Okay, simple innovation is, what's the next level up assembly? The subcomponent's in there, right? A small one. Dealer calls and says, I need this hose, we don't have the hose. Okay, great. You got a car in the lot that's got that hose? Take it out of the freaking car, put it in this car, and I'll replenish the one in that car. Okay. To me, it's solving the problem. It's the incremental stuff. On the quality side, you've got to go do a quality check, right? We've got kits. It's got 40 components in it, and there's an issue with one of the components, and we have to see if it's all there. Go to my quality department, and they create this polka yoke simple wooden board, right? That's not IT. It's wood and it's pegs <laughs> for an operator to check the quality of that kit or the components in that kit in about seven seconds. Right. If, when I was with the Blue Oval, we were putting in a warehouse management system that basically put RFIDs on employees. And I knew where the janitor was at all times of the day <laughs> and how much he had swept. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't tell where the freaking parts were, but I knew how much he had swept. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. You could sit at your desk and try to manage the business at the desk. To me, the greatest innovation that we one of the best examples of innovation our teams come up with is the dispatch boards in our warehouses. You got trucks that are leaving, right? Orders drop at 1, 1 the floor's picking them, the first trucks leave at 3, and they leave till 11, 11 30 at night. They all get their set times, you need all the parts from the different areas of the warehouse to arrive. 
at that time. Now, you're, if you're a supervisor, you can have this system where you can watch where all your employees are and where all the stuff's tracking, or you've got our dispatch boards. We dispatch bin, bulk, molding, et cetera, in sequence, and the employees come in and they take these 30-minute cycle deals, and I can stand at the board and I can tell you if I'm gonna get the parts there to get that truck out on time or if I've gotta go look, right? It costs $400 to put that board together, train the employees on how to use the color-coded cards, and everybody's happy, and it works, <clears throat> right? So, so I think sometimes we overcomplicate it, right? We look for that big jump when there are incremental things that'll get you there, and you're spot on. What's your vision, right? I wanna get the trucks out on time, right? So that's where I always struggle. If you wanna piss your boss off, Ask them how you get a five in innovation on your performance review. <laughs> right? Because you won't be able to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was putting here in a, in a paper, uh, Louis, you were saying, and I think that we have uh, to be uh, careful that not forget the good traditions. You, you said something simple. In logistics, simple, it's fantastic. It's the best that we can do. And... Uh, when we were talking about align to see, to have exactly the same tools, in, I, I, I used to, to talk about it's like a puzzle in some case. Yeah? In, a, in a puzzle also the parts are, are matching one in the other. And normally if you have one piece, you don't need another one for the same, to cover the same position. Yeah? And um, also we were talking about IT solutions, whatever. It's, uh, I, I used to say to my people, hey, first of all, start with Excel. And when we know exactly what we need and we were um, a familiar and whatever, we can ask the people for IT, uh, for IT to, to a better solution. And, for, and I, I really like to have the people from IT working for us and not we normally working for them when they define a new software that they think that is good for us, yeah? But uh, in my, my life also, in, I, I had a lot of fun, so much fun showing to visitors in the factory the simple solutions. It's where I had so much fun. Uh, first of all, they are easy to explain, yeah? <laughs> Even for people that are not from logistics, they can understand this easy solution. Yeah. But this is exactly the, the key for the success. And uh, in, during, as I said, in Pamplona, I, uh, now in, in Chattanooga, I only since two years. But in, in eight years in, in, in Pamplona, we had the opportunity to, to get step by step better and more productive with, even with very simple solutions. But uh, I think I've got a, a, an argument against the strategy point. And, and unfortunately, I, I flip-flop on ideas. I was listening to a podcast about uh, being a soccer manager. And they said, it's not about the tactics. You've got to have the strategy right. And then you build the tactics around your strategy. But how do you build a strategy in this day and age? I mean, if, if the Pinder had, had gone to uh, Honeywell, and said, I've got a great idea. And they would say, well, we had that idea in our strategy. You know, if, uh, if Uber had gone to yellow cabs or to metro cars in Detroit and said, we've got a great idea, where they say, yeah, actually, we had in our strategy some completely different idea that worked off on that. So is, is having a strategy a killer uh, of real innovation? Because you've, you've, got, you, you've got in your mind where you're going to go, Kodak probably had an amazing strategy. You know, they're the, they're the company that we all quote. You know, probably a fantastic strategy. You know, if you were Mark Zuckerberg and you'd gone to IBM, how big would Facebook be now? So is it, and to be honest, I'm not even sure if it's a question. Uh, it's just the thought that if something is going to be a real game changer, you know, we can tweak, we can change, we can do, this is kind of, you know, I've heard from another car maker, tweaking and changing is our everyday basic job. But the game changers aren't necessarily in our strategy unless your strategy is to find a complete game changer. Yeah, if I can, uh, I'm going to stick with um, Depender's uh, mm -hmm. condition, though. He already had a strategy. Yeah. He, okay. he knew what the issue was. Mm -hmm. He knew how he wanted to solve it. He created the product to solve it. Mm -hmm. So he, he had the manufacturing strategy. He, ha he had the strategy to fix a problem. Mm -hmm. 
probably the only thing he was lacking was the deployment and the sales strategy, mm -hmm. right? The marketing, mm -hmm. the marketing part of it. Mm -hmm. That can be developed after the, after the product's developed. Mm -hmm. But when you're, when you're talking about multiple manufacturers, uh, and we, we kind of touched base on this a little bit in, mm -hmm. in our last uh, conversation yeah. about having to, to modify products um, based on the customer, because some, some of our environments are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I'll argue along with anybody up here that it's really not different. We order parts, we deliver parts, we build, we build <laughs> cars. It's really not <laughs> that different. But we have some characteristics yeah. um, that might be a little bit different. So the development of a product to take to the masses that becomes a little more difficult. That's why you're, you, need the, you need the input. We talked earlier about you need the input of the customers mm -hmm. to understand the product we're building, we need to understand what it's, what it's addressing. That's mm -hmm. the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot my point. Mm -hmm. CO2 levels must be up. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple but of thoughts. But the, uh, the, the condition is um, the, the companies need to have input in some of those, in some of those decisions, there are mm -hmm. others like in Depender's situation that he already had it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, there's a difference in vision and strategy, right? Yes. Um, and what's your time frame that you're looking for, right? I, I love when we sit down and do our planning rounds five years out. I don't know what's gonna happen four months from now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can tell you on a vision for service, we want the customer's car up and running as soon as possible, right? So you, Anybody ever watch a movie called Kelly's Heroes? I'm dating myself a little bit, right? Donald Sutherland, a druggie, World War II tank driver. He takes the tank, modifies it, and it's got three forward gears and seven reverse gears. And his, and his argument was, I want to get out of trouble faster than I got into it. <laughs> to me, as you're going along, if you can set what you're doing up, if you've got a vision and you can go along with things that, that get you, but you can scale or you can switch, that's great, because there's very little, at least in what we do, that's going to lead. The same day delivery we were talking about earlier. You heard the term fast follower today, right? Remember IBM never innovated, but they always fast follow. There's a few things that we're going to be fast followers on. There's others we're just going to kind of take a wait and see, and there's other things that we're going to lead. That's right. right? So you, to me, that's part of your vision. What, pick out where you want to be, and then figure out how you get there. Uh, one of the key, key issues, I don't think strategy is, is, is bad or whatever. Okay? So for me, large companies like, like you guys, okay, you don't have any choice. You need, you need strategy, tactics, okay, and get to implementation. I, I think one of the key issues okay, that is at stake is that uh, you're facing paradigms. Okay? You're facing a view of the world, and now the strategy is built with this view of the world. But when that view of the world from social, economic, environmental, technology perspective is being challenged and you're not in a position to recognize that's being challenged, then you build a strategy with a world view that is not correct anymore. Okay? So now you get in trouble. Okay? So the Kodak example is, is a good example of this, mm. okay, where they probably get a good, given their view of the world, they had a great strategy. With the, the, but that world was completely dis, dis, disrupted. So to me, that's one of the key aspects. I, I'd like to go back also to one of the, of the key, key facets, because one of the way to control in a big company is to divide in silos, OK? Mm -hmm. So each silo is easy, OK, to deal with. So I've got an issue with the notion of simple. I like simple. But let me ask you a question, OK? How many people here think this is simple? Yeah. I mean, it, it's simple to use, yeah. okay? It does a bunch of things, okay? It can monitor all kind of things, I can interact, etc. Is it simple? Yeah. It's hugely complex, okay? Mm -hmm. Hugely complex. But it's been canned, it's been packaged, so that functionally it's simple. So that's one of the things that I think also is at stake is the perception of people, of solutions that are not too complex. Uh, I, I've had a lot of experience coming up as a disruptor, okay? And I can tell you that it's about 50 times easier to sell a safe project 
than a disruptive project. Mm -hmm. To transform your, your strategy from something that is safe, everybody's gonna be protected, my bonus is not gonna be affected too much, mm -hmm. et cetera, versus something when we, we could really get it. I had a company, it took them 15 years to realize that they had made a big mistake. Luckily, they still made money out of it, but now they, they recognize it and, and are shifting. But for many companies, this error would have gone down the drain. Yeah, I mean, I think the point about your vision of the world, the strategy fitting is fantastic. What's the product life cycle for a car? How long does it take from concept to development, right? If you're good, two and a half, three years, you use carryover parts, maybe two, it used to be five to seven. We're trying to design vehicles for what customers' expectations are three years down the road, right? Design interfaces, et cetera. What are the odds of getting that right? Anybody ever go to a customer? Part of our responsibility is the um, market research, your product research, market research, customer research. Right? Every time you have one, you get different feedback. Right? So I, mean, I think that's, that's a great point. It's based on your view of the world. Yeah, right. So how do you get your view of the world to think what's not known? And what happens if your competitor got a better shot as of the view and got a better understanding of the view of the world in three years from now yeah. and they launch something that you don't have included in your product and now you got a mess. Then you're following, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, to, uh, to use the, the, uh, the phone as an example, um, you think about the development cycle of the phone. By the time, uh, by the, time the iPhone 6 was released, the iPhone 7 was already developed. <laughs> And guarantee the iPhone 8 was probably in, in design phase. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how fast their development cycle is. Yeah. Fortunately, ours isn't quite that fast. Hopefully, we never get there. We'll, <laughs> we'll drive ourselves crazy. Yeah. But it, it, I mean, they're, and they're trying to look at what, is, what, does the, what does our customer want in six months? Yeah, I mean, it's just a personal example. Prior to life, one of the companies that came out for minivans with the dual sliding doors, right? We didn't, we missed it. It took about 18 months to get it into production. Mm -hmm. In the interim, we, we came up with this great idea. Let's make the driver's side door nine inches bigger. Right, so it'll be easier to get in the back seat. Yeah. Anybody ever try to open that door next to another car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You physically can't do it in a parking spot, right? But it sold, the idea sold great, right? Um, customers didn't buy it, and then on the service part side, I'm servicing that friggin' door for one model year, nine inches longer for 15 years. What it cost to tool that, right? I mean, that's when the total view of the business is lacking. So um, we, we were talking about strategy versus, I think, uh, no company, no big company can, can work with not having a strategy, but we have maybe to be smart enough to readapt if we see that things change. And this is maybe the key. Mm -hmm. How to do this? I don't know. I have no idea, yeah? <laughs> if not, I will, we will not be sitting here, yeah? Um, the, other, the other issue is um, also we were talking about what the competitors are doing, whatever. And this remembers me a professor in the university that said engineers are not good businessmen, no? engineers calculating risk, whatever. Some businessmen are doing some things not knowing what the result is and they are successful or not. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It happens. We are maybe in Volkswagen going in one direction, others going in another. Let us see what the clients will prefer at the end. It's a risk. It's a, it's a high risk. And what normally in the big companies we are doing is, is trying to minimize or to stay, um, let the, the risk in certain, in, in between certain amounts, you know? And uh, for me, at the end, as I said, it's a, it's a, a strategy is needed, but we have to see what, what new is coming that we can use to, to, to learn and to, to adapt to our needs. One of the things, it's come up from a few speakers today and at the past conferences is this, uh, uh, the need to fail sometimes, right, to, to advance. And uh, well, I can tell you, you don't go where Louis and I are sitting without failing a lot in your life anyway. But, um, but besides that, I mean, the, the, the thing that, um, that struck me and it was brought up again, I think, by Robert Sanchez, the CEO of Ryder, 
some months back at another conference. Again, I made this point yesterday. It's Silicon Valley investments, right? Venture capitalism. Out of 20 companies that venture capitalists invest in, they probably expect 15 to just fail outright. Maybe two or three to break <coughs> even, and maybe, well, then one or two to make all of the money. That's probably not a model that's terribly applicable to the purchasing departments uh, for automotive <laughs> logistics. <laughs> but, no, no, but, but uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, and so my question would be how, how, how do you create a space to fail without it kind of, you know, losing your job? Uh, because clearly you do need that space, you do need that experimentation, but, but we, we have organizations aren't perhaps designed for that. Uh, if I may on this, I, I'm discussing oftentimes with, uh, with people like you and uh, in several companies. And one thing that I've come to realize is that uh, in all of your companies invest a huge amount of money in R&D. Okay? Huge amount of money. How much is invested in supply chain and logistics R&D? <laughs> Good question. It's a huge <laughs> multiple orders of magnitude difference. So you allow yourself to explore and test and fail way, way, way more on your pro products and services and systems than you do with your supply chain and logistics. You don't go that much and try. There's not that much research says, okay, let's spend $5 million, okay, investigating this new logistics concept. Okay? Wow, okay, how many companies have you seen doing this, okay, uh, recently? So that is a key issue. If it, and, and, then, and then we talk about Silicon Valley. Well, I'm in Atlanta now, and uh, Atlanta, I mean, I was talking to people from Silicon Valley and they said, you know what, in Atlanta, you're the Silicon Valley of supply chain and logistics. We'd love to be here. I won't name the, per the person and company, but uh, switching. But f Silicon Valley thrives on risk, okay? On trying stuff and entrepreneurships and all that. So, so somehow the field has to stand up the executives, the key players, and say, guys, okay, we're as important to you, the future of those companies, okay, as all those components, and you guys are gonna have to help us, okay, innovate or whatever, otherwise, there's no more production of cars that's gonna be done here, okay, it's gonna be done elsewhere, okay, and imported, or our company's gonna fail or whatever. So, so somehow there's, there's this, this willingness, eagerness, and capability to, to go and test, go and explore, go and innovate, et cetera. And maybe I'm wrong, okay, but, but that's a big perception I've developed in the last 10 years. No, I don't think you're too far off on that, on that concept. And, um, you know, Bill, Bill Wappler explained uh, sitting down at the table with his wife and saying, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm investing our retirement um, we're not talking about really taking those kind of risks. And it, you know, the sign of a good leader, I've always been told, the sign of a good leader is somebody that can understand 70% of the condition and make a, make a decision. And I, I think, uh, you know, we get, so, we get so caught up in we can't fail. Um, I don't want to fail personally. I don't want to fail as a company. You tell me with 100% surety that this is going to work and I'll give you a go. Well, at that point, that's where, that's where we can truly outsource to a computer. Because a computer, a computer can tell you that, or we can start hiring children. Yeah. <laughs> the yep. children can become our leaders and make all the decisions for us, because there's 100% surety. There's no risk on, on a leader's part. You know, a true leader is going to step up and say, it's a, it's a valid issue, it's a valid response, it's an acceptable risk, let's go. Yeah, I, mean, I think the point's spot on. It's, we, our role, we're 40% of the Volkswagen Group of America's cost base. I, I guarantee you I'm not 40% of our investment, <laughs> our CapEx, <laughs> our thought process. I'm typically 60 to 70% of the task. Right? Um, I used to work for, for a gentleman that always said we sandbagged. Because whenever we got it and you'd give it a higher proportional task, we figured out how to do it, right? Small innovation, you, you figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're getting us to a point where the only way I can get you to believe me is to fail. And if we fail on our end, what happens? Right? Those beautiful cars that we spent the R&D money developing or the technology, 
don't get delivered, don't get sold, right? Right, what they are. But it's a cultural deal, right? I'm not sure, I don't, I've been out of the business for 30 years and you've been, there's, I'm not sure there's a culture of accepting failure, right? You may get away with it once or twice. Um, I think we're, we're, I can see some level of change. To me, it's always a matter of how fast do you fix it? Right? That's right. Um, and how do you fix it? Yeah. Are, you, are you modifying a report? Are you changing your metric? Are you really fixing real issue? But I think that's, that's, that's a great question. How do you get the grown-ups <laughs> to understand the value other than just it's a cost center? Logistics is not a profit center. Right? It's not a revenue center. So if you aren't revenue and profit and you're simply cost, how do you go sell? You can always come up with ROI and all that kind of stuff, right? You go to the investment committee and you gotta, you gotta meet this hurdle. My argument is if you can meet that hurdle, then why are we losing money? I mean, that's a different debate. But yeah, it's, it's a cultural change. And if you get it back to the people that we're starting to hire, does it start with the people we're bringing in? Okay, may I, may just, just for fun, okay? You, you've put it that logistics supply chain is cost reduction. Yeah. I think you've said it about four or five times, okay? Yeah. Well, in our new models now, okay, we're challenging this and say that you can have impact on revenue. Right. Mm -hmm. okay? right. Mm -hmm. This oh. is very tough to, to sell in the company, it but is. it's clear it can make a difference. We can show that better logistics, better supply chain, Result especially is. if you start at the near the consumer, okay? You think it through all the way back, you can show that if you've got smart logistics supply chain, you can impact by significant percentage the total sales that you'll do because you will not lose a sale due to a supply chain error, right. okay? And that you will avoid having substitutions, okay, that will give you less margins or make your customer unsatisfied. Yeah, I mean, you're coming up with new ways to do it. The, I was at a global meeting a couple months ago, and one of the best definitions I'd ever heard for efficiency. Ask a logistics person what efficiency means, right? Better, faster, cheaper, what, however you want to define it. The definition that we got, and it was actually from one of the heads of a uh, national sales company, said it's a relationship between cost and revenue. Mm -hmm. And he said, think about it. It's okay to have costs go up as long as the revenue is growing at a faster rate. Yep. And you had to see the look in the rooms on the faces of the people there. Simple concept, but it's one, without getting you in the numbers, and what he said was, here's what happens. Everyone signs up for this revenue. We put this cost in. We're at this ratio. Everyone's happy. As the forecasts go on, revenue comes down, but the costs keep going up. Wrong way on efficiency. <laughs> right? We're okay investing in this, but it's got to have what you're talking about, that relationship to go up. And if you start thinking about it that way, then you start to change the culture. Now you're in big strategy, you're in big business model type yeah. of thinking. <laughs> now you're, you're talking with the, with the board up yeah. there. Yeah, and that culture, that, that change in culture is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. Um, so but that, that change in culture is actually trying to switch from a do more with less. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there's no expectation your cost is going to go up even if your revenue goes yep. up. Your expectation is your costs are going to go down and revenue is going to go up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, what, what I want to add also, I, I think your, your, your comment that how many, uh, what we are expanding to develop products and compare with logistics, it's, uh, I think that I will talk with my bosses about. Um, <laughs> but uh, there is also related to this, um, it's, uh, it's a fact also in the factory, I'm talking now in, in the production. When we buy some equi equipment, we, we have some allowance. Normally, if we need 100 parts, we are buying an equipment that it's able to produce 120 and whatever. Yeah? So there is, normally we talk about 80% availability of a certain equipment and whatever, but in logistic, I never heard about it. Every time it's in the logistic of the production, it's every time 100%, yeah? And we had some discussions with colleagues and whatever to define a KPI, and at the end we said, okay, it will, can be maybe 99.9, .9, yeah? But we are, it's a, it's a different situation when we are working with the production and um, uh, it's a high risk uh, to experiment something and put in risk the, the 
the availability of the parts when we are producing cars in, in the plants normally every minute it's, it's a car. So every minute that a part is not there is a, is a car that we are losing. So, but, but there we can learn a lot from the entrepreneurs, the world, what they're doing now, okay? The big switch is now into lean startups, okay? So the lean startup is not to, to do it all, revolutionize everything, have the perfect project. It is what can we test that will show that it's going to make a difference, okay? So it's, it's not trying to do it all in one shot. Just what is it we can test there? And remember those who've been in the cellular manufacturing okay, uh, type of era, when we got the group technology sales and all that, what would they do? They would pick the simplest place possible in the full company and then put it as a cell and then show that it works. Yep. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and then they'd go to the next one. And the more they would do, they'd be more complex. But the people would have learned, they're capable of doing it. I think in logistics, we have to learn to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. okay? So pick places where it's not too risky, where right. we can show that there's improvement. Mm -hmm. It may not be the full thing. And also, it's no big deal to have an army of stuff just besides on their clothing so that if it goes wrong, we just pick there. Yeah. But when it's going to be 30 days that you've never used one single of those 200 parts that you've put there, you're going to begin to believe that, hey, this can work. And you didn't break anything. And if it would have broken, no big deal. We've got 200 there. <laughs> so, so you see, so that's this kind of uh, allowing us to, say, to, to, to fail, but not jeopardizing everything. But I, I have yeah. to say that we are doing things like this, yeah? Okay, good. It's not, it's not that we are not doing nothing about this. It's exactly this is what we normally do to make, to run new experiments, let me say, yeah? Mm. But, but it's not easy in our case due to the fact that, or let me say, um, there is um, what they expect from us, delivering parts for production is 100%. Mm. And this is uh, something that my service provider that is in the corner can help me <laughs> saying that it's exactly this is the point, yeah? Jens? <clears throat> oh, uh, any, any questions from the audience, actually? We should bring, bring you guys into it if you... Uh, ah, yeah. oh. yep. We can see the light shining off the top there, so we can yeah. see you. <laughs> if I may, and maybe Louis in another conference another day, we can really get deep into the economics mm -hmm. of the conversation as well. But a new, I was struck the other day I, on a plane like all of us are, reading articles, and there was a dissertation about uh, moving uh, with 3D printing away from the auto manufacturers into the hands of UPS and mm -hmm. FedEx where they have all the infrastructure, they can deliver so quickly, they're yep. so efficient, but you give up, if you will, the right to print. It's, it's now theirs. And it was talking about really that the value of then the auto manufacturer is in intellectual property. And there's this whole conversation about the most difficult part of that is not the technology. The most difficult part of it is the economics and turning the big boat to accept new business models. Do you, do you find that in your conversations internally? Is, is the conversation of economics um, maybe one of, of the driving factors in some of your decisions? Yeah, I mean, math, numbers, money always plays, plays in any decision we're making. I think all too often you, you see something coming at, at you and it's going to change or disrupt your business. And our first reaction, I'm just generalizing, is how do I delay it or how do I protect what I have? You know, I mean, service parts business, depending on who you choose to believe, every auto company does it, right? At a prior one, we believed there were about $100 billion worth of parts a year being sold for our vehicles. Aftermarket. Uh, that's right, that, that's for the total industry. OEs have about $25 billion of it. Somebody's selling $75 billion worth of parts to somebody, right? Um, so what you try to do is you, you figure out how do I hold on to my shrinking piece of the pie? And it goes in this downward spiral and I retire 
three, four, five, six years from now, and then someone else has got to do it, right? But, but I survived to the end. That's why I try to get our team to think of, like we had on the slide today, everything that's coming at us, where's the opportunity in what's coming at us? Right? I think low volume parts should be out. It's gonna be better service, it's gonna be lower cost, and I don't make money at it anyways, right? So why am I playing in that, you know, 10% of my business, that's 40% of my inventory that I don't make a penny on. Right? But until we, until we get past that, that's ours to protect. Right? I don't think, I don't think we get there. Uh, and when was the last time you saw a business decision made on, trust me, this will help us seven years from now? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, or three years from now, or whatever is around the corner. So I, I think it's a great conversation. I, I think if you, so, just the last comment, I, why do we play in that element other than it's ours? We believe we can provide better service than other people can. I think there's demonstrated proof that in those parts we can't. Okay, so I you let them in, right? Um, LKQ. The model they play in with collision in the service parts of business is amazing, right? Um, they're always going to be X percent lower price than us. They get to pick and choose which parts for which vehicles they're going to play in. They don't play in the low end stuff. So if you go with the normal auto <coughs> pricing model, which is on your captive parts, you raise your prices. On your competitive parts, you bring them down to be 5% <coughs> over the industry average, right? You keep it that way. I sat with the, I sat with the CEO of LK, LKQ. Here's what he told me several years ago. I'm always going to be priced lower than you, and if you keep increasing the price of captive parts, you just allowed me to come into that market as well. And you sit there across from a guy that thinks faster, more nimble, more entrepreneurial than you, and you sit there and you go, I'm screwed. <laughs> right? So how do, you, how, do you, how do we work in that type of business environment? Right? I mean, it's, it's a great question. But it, so I think if you, if you change your mindset to say, what's the opportunity? Right? And if you can lay that down and if there's business models out there that, that can show it and new ways of looking at it, mm -hmm. then I think we change this. Yeah, and Bill, and Bill from, my, from my perspective, um, of course money enters, finances enter into the decision. Um, even if you've got a good payback, you know, we've, been, we've been talking about autonomous vehicles, we've been talking about electrification of our vehicles, there's a lot of money being poured into R&D to keep up with that technology, and there's an there, there isn't an unlimited amount of funds. So we know we have to spend that to stay competitive, so some things have to go by the wayside, even if they have payback. Yeah, my, my take on this is uh, directly for 3D printing is uh, there's a four or five year period that has already started where all this industry and this supply chain will be shaped and will be stuck with it for the next 20, 25 years. Uh, I urge you to get engaged. Like you would talk with UPS, okay, UPS has signed a partnership with SAP and, uh, and a number of other companies and they're trying to do something. Pick that group or any other group, but try to figure it out, okay, it's, it's so important. Because the notion of IP is, is big deal, but we should find a smart way to get around this. It's much, it, it may become much brighter for a company to have it done elsewhere, but we understand that the, you must not give up everything that you've done and the IP. And I think that 3D printing, if, if well packaged, can be really smart along those lines. One simple example I've given is that right now we have the impression that you just put material in and it's gonna do your 3D print. Uh, this is a very simplistic version of what's happening because mo most of the time it may be a single material, but which material is it? It's a big deal. And more and more it's gonna be combinations of materials. So just having a file that tells what to do with the printer, etc., you could bring materials and this material would be unknown to the printer. So you would not know what he's printing with, okay? Because this would be a mix that you've dealt with another one. So there's a smart way to get around this at Georgia Tech. We're, we're 
spinning about all those kinds of versions, and there are many other places around the world, but do experiment it. It's a, it's a big disruptor, okay? And, but, but it's a dis disruptor that has started 20 years, 25 years ago. It's just keeping getting momentum. But don't forget that in the spare parts world, it's gonna be a big deal, the small volume and all that. So there are many ways you guys can, can exploit this. Yep. We have a question over there, I believe. Start there. Yeah. So this was a pretty interesting comment. From my perspective, I've always thought the auto industry has already evolved from that piece. Uh, you may not be doing 3D printing, but the very fact that you're subcontracting it out right. means your value is already in just the IP because you're already really system integrators. You may be re-stamping it out, so it's maybe just a question of re-looking at it as like it's not your or whatever your L1, L2 supplier, but it's already, it's just UPS, right? Because uh, it's not as if you're truly manufacturing stuff in-house that much anymore. If I may add also from the finance perspective, uh, I, I, the more I see how it's evolving, and maybe again I'm wrong, you're much better experts in automotive, but for me, the notion is that going to a facility to repair something on my own is something that's going to be more and more obsolete. Mm -hmm. It's something that you'll have tracked, sensed, come up, and if you're smart, you'll have told me to go there for 10 minutes because there's some adjustment to do in my car, okay? And you'll have dealt with all the mess associated with ordering that and all that and made my life much, much easier. Mm. In that case, then you're controlling who's printing, at what time, where, et cetera. So to me, that it, there's this big chasm that, that is being, we're beginning to cross right now. One thing that um, came up a couple of times, uh, perhaps slightly from opposing <coughs> perspectives. Um, yesterday, I believe it was Jim Rusty from Electrolux and uh, perhaps Mel from Ryder who said, you know, gather your data even if you don't know how to use it. <laughs> Basically, gather it, store it, and take all of it, um, and then kind of figure it out. And then Anu, you, you raised it in the point that maybe we need to slow down a little bit if we take on this data and we don't actually know what we're doing with it, what's the value there. So I wanted to kind of put it out there that, I mean, we talk about big data, we talk about the potential of big data, we know in theory with predictive analytics the possibility to to make decisions or ahead, whether it's for sales forecasting or based on logistics conditions. But you know, today, um, in general, do you, in your organizations, do you know what to do with this data? Is it valuable to you yet? Can, or, and and is, there, is there a point in get, massing it all and hoping someone can figure it out later? For us, we collect a ton of data. Yeah. I mean, just like anyone else does. Um, we've got pockets of our company that are figuring out what to do with it. Okay, when we talk innovation, they got an idea. And the area that's the most ahead for us, and at least from what I can see in our company, is our customer relationship management center. Mm -hmm. The data mining on customers' information is unbelievable. Right? So you start to anticipate needs, what their wants are, their desires. And if you can build that up front in your product development process, you got something. So I think the area that's leading it is the right area that's leading it. Mm -hmm. And what I watch for is have chats with, the, with that individual or that department every month to start that, how are they thinking, how do I relate it to our business? Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, just if you take them to the hard parts world, you start to go start a remand program. You need a core charge, you gotta bring the part back, right? Some companies bring, have a core charge on it and bring everything back and they scrap because they don't have a remand program. Why do they do it? Because if they don't, someone else is gonna take that Someone's going to offer the dealer some money for that part, and they're going to be selling a remand engine transmission in the market. So it's a proactive move on their part. Does the same thing apply with data? Do you do it so you don't get, so someone else doesn't take it, take your customers? Uh, related to the to the data, it's a it's a, it's a good question, uh, uh, I I remember last year in the conference someone was. Uh, talking about and my experience is you can have a lot of data but you have to find a way to highlight the important one from the other to filter um, my experience is if we are receiving hundreds of mails a day and whatever I don't know if you are able to read all of them with all the till the end of so 
And this is, this is, uh, this is something that <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a task that we have to learn, that we have to, to discuss with our people, to have the right data at the right time. This is, a, it's, it's not easy. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there is a school to learn about this. It's, uh, a lot is related with experience. And uh, I, I used to show examples, or to talk about examples on the planes, yeah? Uh, if you go in a, in, a, in a cockpit of a jumbo, or a, yeah, there is a lot of lights, yeah? But I suppose that there are one more important that if something goes really wrong, are, are, are lighting <laughs> brighter as the other. And this is, this is exactly the, the point with, with big data. You can have a lot of data, actually, all is available, but the, the way how to pay attention about the important one that can help you in a daily business, this is the, the key of the question. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, I would agree with that comment. The, the short answer to your question is no. Uh, we, we don't necessarily know what to do with all the data, but the, the, the real point is, uh, as, as you just said, you've got to prioritize it. You, you can't go after everything and fix everything. So you prioritize the ones that mean the most to you and uh, attack those until they don't mean anything to you anymore. And how do you collect them? I mean, we were talking about parts returns earlier, just to put it in real world stuff. Go to our dealerships that take special orders from customers. How many of them got the name, phone number, or email of the customer that came in for the part? Just something basic, right? Part comes in, they didn't even take a deposit. Now they call me up, they want to send the low selling part back. I mean, you would, it's, it's just some of the basics, right? Someone comes in, wants something, name, number, phone number, email, Deposit. Basics. Yeah, they'll come back. Right? We miss some of those basics. Yeah, I, I will agree with all of you that uh, if there are some, there are some targets okay, that are obvious. One is, one is the clients. I, I, I've asked many times, how many of you are keeping track of what the consumer really wanted as a vehicle? Okay, when he, yeah. he discussed with your salesperson and really found okay, what he would have. I'm not telling what he, what he purchased, what he wanted, okay? what, or what he should have bought given what, what, what would have been for it. So oftentimes it's not there. Okay? It's not modeled, nothing at all. So that creates a big void in, for example, we don't forecast demand. We forecast sales, okay? Because we've got no idea what was the past demand. It's it's, it's kind of crazy. The other place where there's a lot of, of big data is all about the, our vehicles, our fleets, our equipment, uh, our products, etc. So there's going to be a big flow uh, out, of, out of all that. I, our experience until now is that. The data itself is not such a big deal, okay? It, it's when you begin to process the data. So try to begin to filter it and work with it. And so that's where it becomes to be more costly. And then when you begin to put people to analyze it, okay? And then, and, and so on climbing the ladder. And, and if you don't have your big targets with actionable items and actionable goals and answers, then there's a lot of waste. It's not a big data itself, it's, it's everything in between okay, that it can shoot in all kinds of directions and, and not pay off. Interesting, and this isn't a question really, it's just I recently bought a car, and when I bought the car I was also looking at a car for my daughter in the same brand. Uh, I bought the car and that was the end of the kind, I bought my car, or my wife's car really, and that was the end of the conversation. They never followed, in fact the only email I got then after that was, there's a new version of my car coming out in, in six months. Well that's not good to me, that's not good to you either, because I'm not <laughs> going to buy that car. Yeah. But I never got any follow up saying, hey we've got a great new, I don't know, mats for the car or, or whatever it is, or, or something where you would actually, the car maker would get value from it, and there was no follow up on the conversation, real conversations I had about my daughter's car. So the, you, the, the collection, all right, this is the dealer, not the car maker, but the lack of that, da the, that da data is, is amazing, or the lack of collection yep. was on Amazon or whatever it is, you know, you get an email for the next six months about something you considered buying, <laughs> uh, you know, at some yeah. stage. So we, we definitely, the car industry misses a trick there. 
But uh, a question really for uh, is we kind of talk about what, what the whole industry is doing, maybe, but a question, uh, perhaps I'll start with Benoit, maybe, but then go to the others as well. What advice would, would you give your logistics providers? How should they, how would you want them to develop? And, and maybe to the car makers, is it part, when you're doing your next uh, RFQs, or do you actually say to them, right, you know, this is what we want and we want it really cheap? Or do you actually, is innovation, is forward looking, is something part of your requirement and request for your logistics service providers? But I'll start with Benoit, uh, as what advice would you give to a logistics service provider, how they need to plan and develop for the next five or 10 years? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I've had several discussions with many of them, and uh, many of them are, are scared to death about what's happening right now, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're scared to death with the, U uh, the Uber type of mentality and this Airbnb and <laughs> flex.com and all of that. So it scares them, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, they're scared of becoming commodity, of being bypassed, uh, etc. They see potentially their market shrinking. Uh, so, so they can easily get into a very defensive type of, of, of mentality. Uh, what I'm trying to explain to them is that this is a very narrow view of the world because if it gets into sharing more, this means that these guys here okay, will do less by themselves. Okay? So somebody else will be servicing them. But they're going to service them not the old way. Okay? Might not be like a taxi, but more like a Uber. Okay? But Uber makes a lot of money. Okay, in there. So, so there's, there's this potential, there's going to be more business into it. So the goal is not to create more transport. In fact, we want to globally reduce the transport cost. Okay? And then it goes the same with storage. Okay? So it's basically, yeah, we want to store less, but we start smartly, well-located, etc. So the overall pie we'd like to, for it to reduce but now a lot of it is taken by these people because they are not confident enough about the rest and they, they want to control risk so they do it by themselves. So service providers would be smart would, and, and would prove that they, they, don't, they, they don't become the bottleneck. Okay? So if they become the bottleneck, well, they'll do exactly like Amazon has been doing now uh, with FedEx and UPS, you can deliver. I'll buy planes, I'll buy trucks, and I'll do it by myself. Yeah, so this, but if you can prove that collectively you can do it better, then the pie for the, for the logistics service provider grows. And, it, and then if you add to it like the 3D printing and the added value work, the postponement type of work, you can do even more. So, but, but they have to be careful, okay? They have to, it, it's very demanding, okay? It's, what I'm talking about is, is hugely tough for the for logistics service provider. This is very tough. Another thing is uh, many of them are, are not inclined to do a lot of innovation, a lot of automation, et cetera, because our contract, they're used to small contracts, they, they cannot justify mm. it. But in this new game, if you have to be able to, to work with the new rules, you have to innovate. So this is very demanding against for them. Okay? Mm -hmm. Some of them are doing it and doing it very nicely. Others have trouble. Okay? And I'm talking big as well as small ones in there. Mm -hmm. and, and my last comment would be, if you become the constraint, get out of there or transform. Okay, so for example, if you like, I'll take an example. Something is brought from China, okay, and is ordered in Paris. And when it has to come to the US to get to Paris, I'm in trouble, okay? <laughs> and that's what is done every single day of the year by thousands and thousands of products right now. And so, so when you become the constraint because you, you want to capture the client okay, to yourself and not show it, you're becoming a problem. And, and these guys okay, will not accept that. And the suppliers will not accept that. So now you're going to be pulled out of the game. Uh, you, you said something. I think that it's exactly the right point. Service provider, what, what I expect is that they are doing something uh, to make me um, need them, no. to, to avoid that 
you know, if they are not adding nothing special, means innovation, maybe using the experience from, I, I really like when they are working for more than other clients to learn from the others, you know, what happens. Yeah. Uh, if not, I, I, in, in my time in Argentina, we, we were running an uh, insourcing, yeah? Not, 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 not every time you are, we are making outsourcing yeah, at this time. And it was in a point about, but when we say, hey, this business can be done by us, we don't need a service provider there. So and this is why, why I ask my service provider is bring us ideas, bring ideas, make, make us need you. Yeah, I mean, just to add on to that point, in simple terms, why am I doing what you do for a living? Okay. Am I doing it because I can do it better? Faster, cheaper, better service? I'm more customer focused? What value do you bring? I love, love the idea you're dealing with other people. It's easy to say bring ideas forward. To me, it's what's your value add? Okay, because the typical life cycle is companies are starting off, don't have the footprint, go with a 3PL. Then when it goes on, it becomes a contractual relationship and it's line item cost management, right? I'm getting billed for 140 rolls of toilet paper, right? Seriously, right? Well, the contract allowed for 120, really? Right? If that's the relationship you get into, it's not a customer folks relationship. So how many of you are actually focused on adding value for our customers? You can say you are, are you? If you are, then why am I doing it? To me, it just goes in the life cycle. It starts off outside, comes inside, and then someone wants to manage costs. And if you truly are lower cost, why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. Do I own my customers better than you do? If I do, why is that? Right? And that's the question that I always struggle with third-party logistics providers. Right? Are you taking care? How do you take care of my customers better than I do? Or how can you? So maybe a little twist on what everybody's just said. Um, in very simple terms, you should be telling your service provider your product isn't a vehicle. Your, your product is a service. So your R&D money should be going into improvement of that service. And if you're an existing uh, service provider, you should constantly be listening. You know, what, what problems are, I'm, in, I'm embedded with the customer. I'm doing a service for them. I see what the problems are every day. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, well, I had a conversation just the other night with someone that I said, you have to be honest enough with us to tell us when we're screwed up. I mean, that's a, that's a value added. To, that's when they make themselves yep. the party that we want to be at the table with us. When they tell you you're you're not doing this quite right, of course they can do it politely, but <laughs> you're not doing this quite right. And there's a better way to get to get after it. And we think we we can help you with that. It's a good point because I heard uh, from another car maker who was here uh, at the conference and said they were in they were being moaned at and said you know you just want cheap 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 you know and he was and he said to them, but. Uh, but no, not if you provide a good service. And they said, but then we get past to your purchasing guys, and then the purchasing guys turn it into we want cheap, cheap. And he said to them, then you're not providing a good enough service to us, because you, it's kind of what you said, Roberto, at the beginning. If you became invaluable to us, uh, you know, the, uh, in the planning and operations, we would tell the purchasing guys as, as, as much as we can, mm -hmm. say, we want this guy. We want this company. Right. All right, you know, I suppose the purchasing's job is to then fight over the cost a little bit, but this is the company that we want to use and this is, these are the services we want from them. Is that, is that a reasonable discussion? Is that how a logistics service provider should then present themselves to? It's kind of a summary of yeah. what you've all just said. I mean, the question I asked you, everyone's heard the term single sourcing or directed sourcing, right? Mm -hmm. How many purchasing departments think that's a good term? <laughs> Zero. Why? Because we're reliant on you and we don't trust you and we're going to get screwed on pricing. Yeah. Right? There isn't anything in there about value mm. equation right. in there, right? Mm. So why, quite, I've had personally responsible for 20 plus years of my career. Why is single sourcing or directed sourcing a negative term? <clears throat> oh, you hit, the, you hit the nail on the head. You, you had the right term in there, value. Yep. 
not looking for pricing, looking for value. Mm. If but somebody can come in and, and do, a, do a service for us at $3 million and return four, but somebody else comes in at three and a half and, and delivers six, where do you think we're going to go? Mm -hmm. One of the things that is, that is important from a logistics service provider perspective is, uh, I'll use UPS as an example, okay? UPS is kind of, there are many variants within UPS, but I'll take two. There's the parcel delivery, and there's the supply chain solution delivery. In this case, they're moving parcels that are essentially black boxes, okay? You, they just need an address, a source destination, how fast you want it, and that's it, okay? They put it in the, their world port, they're gonna cross it around. Then you've got the supply chain solution group. And those guys, basically their business model is to tell you guys that you're so special, okay? <laughs> that we have to design something that's gonna create a lot of value for you. And so what they'll end up doing, like everybody else, is take a slot of a facility or s some facilities, dedicate it for you, and take six months to, to link with your ERP system and processes and all that. And their goal is to have you as a customer attached for 20 years, yep. okay? So I name UPS, they're not bad or good or whatever, that's not the point, they're just an example. As logistics service provider, you'll have to position yourself, what is the best model, okay? Is this the kind of engineer to order, okay, very customized for each one type of solution, getting there, or can I think that, gosh, I think stupid that you guys have 100 different types of cages, okay, sitting into your logistics center. It just doesn't make any sense. Let's make it simpler, modular, etc. And I'll do this for a third of the price of, of what the other ones will do it. Look at, or, or it can be the same price, but you, you'll have much, much less investment in overall when I look the system. So I think that this is part of the big thinking that logistics service providers will have to think in the, in the, in the next 10 years. Otherwise, they'll be out of business. I don't think you can be both. And, and, and I think that either way, there, there's, there is going to lead them to very different paths. Yep. Any questions from the audience? Well, I'm going to... Oh, no, there's a question from the young lady over there. Um, this is shifting gears a little bit back to the, you know, kind of future and, and product development. But I actually heard from... Um, a design, you know, um, from uh, Audi that the supply chain will shrink uh, because of the complexity and that integration between software and hardware on a vehicle is going to require, um, there'll be, there'll be few, fewer people that can do it and also um, require that it comes back in-house. So that's in contrast to something we heard yesterday where an OEM would actually outsource the, outsource the manufacturing of their vehicle in the future. So can you talk a little bit about which way it may go and why? Um, wow. Okay, so since I'm Audi, I'll, I'll give you my, my first shot at it. I think different companies have different philosophies on how they want to go about it. Right? What do they believe their intellectual property is? I think what's going to happen is the customer interface elements. Um, we at VW Group, we, we tend to be more vertically integrated than some other companies. We think we can do it better. Here's the challenge that I, the question I always ask in meetings, because we believe in group standards, software solutions, et cetera. R take a RIM system. There are companies out there that do RIM, right? So take, you know. What makes us think we can do it better? Now, I believe with our resources, our scale, our scope, we can develop a product that will be comparable and competitive with what's out there. I do not believe we will ever invest, because of what we were talking about earlier in logistics, to maintain new functionality or keep that up to date so we will have something that's best in class on day one, and then over the next few years, it won't be best in class, and we'll live and we'll survive and life will go on, and the industry passes you by. 
and then we'll make, make an investment 10 years from now and get it back to where the industry is. It's not our core business. It's the age old what's core, what's not core. And that is the discussion that I believe is happening. And there's different thoughts on what's core, what's not core. I mean, ask Tesla what their core is. Is their core the design of the car? Is their core their software? Is their core their electric technology? Ask them what it is. And you'll, it, it, I think you'd be surprised at the answer you get. I was. Um, it's not what I expected them to say. And when you think that way, you come up with a completely different answer. Auto companies used to be vertical integrated all up and down, right? Is sheet metal a core competency? The design might be, but stamping it is or isn't. Is powertrain, right? Engines, transmissions, core. There are differences amongst every automaker in their powertrain. You could argue that. The human interface with the technology, CarPlay, et cetera. Can Google and Apple do that better than us? Right? So I think you got to break it down into those elements. Um, I, can, I can also add uh, about the, the issue to let, uh, uh, let uh, suppliers produce cars. We had an, in Volkswagen an experience in Brazil, a truck factory uh, that was uh, running like this. But in the, in the meantime, now it's, it's been managed by, by MIN people. MIN is a, is, a, is a truck brand from Volkswagen. Um, this, this shows that maybe it was, it was an experiment, but now we are going the traditional way. I mean, one, I mean, if I could sort of add, I suppose, uh, I think part of maybe what the discussion is also about is the kind of modular production concepts and a move towards that where, where you sort of break apart the assembly line, you work in small stations, you, you're doing more with modular things. So you, and, and with the EV move, you're talking about much fewer, fewer, you know, parts. So at that point, the proposition to, you know, I guess this is where the, the debate goes, is that stay in or out or what stays core. But I suppose in terms of the parts, maybe eventually reduce, part numbers reducing, <coughs> perhaps that's going to be the contributing factor. It's also sort of hard to see sometimes when I'm sure your immediate forecast on you is probably to see more parts at least over the next five years or as far as you can kind of forecast, but in more long term. That's sort of the concepts that I've heard discussed. Yeah, I mean, there's one OE out there. Last time I looked, there's 20 part numbers to build a vehicle because they come in as modules, right? The yeah. interior, the exterior, the, the seat, 4,000 service part numbers. Okay. <laughs> but it's 20 part numbers, and that's why you have supplier parks built around these plants, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds easy. What goes into that, right? A average seat's got 200 service part numbers in it. Right? Because if you're a customer, you come in um, and you need a spring for the seat. Do you want to buy the whole seat or do you want to buy the spring? Sure. So those are the, that gets in the total cost of ownership. So it goes. A, you got the manufacturing element of it up front, but then you got to start taking a look at the total cost, and that's what I think we we get better at, but we're not there yet. Okay. Uh, maybe on this, the, yeah. the next 20 years, 30 years, are gonna. We're going to see big evolutions on the design of, of vehicles, okay? Uh, if we go autonomous, the notion, the cars now are used between two and five percent of the time. So now we're going to use them much more than this, meaning that they're going to have multi-purpose. So meaning that during the day, early on, they're going to bring you to work. After that, they're going to be used to carry off people to the hospital or to, uh, to get goods okay, to, to places, etc. So it may well be that click, click, we're going to unsnap something, snap something at some place, and your vehicle is going to be used uh, otherwise. So I think this is coming. It's hard to see exactly what's coming. but. Big differences. The nerve, the nervous, the nervous system of a car is getting much more of the percentage of the overall cost. So that's going to be another big deal. Uh, if you go electrical, the complexity of all the engine and all that is going down. The battery cost increases. Will the battery be attached to the vehicle or something you can snap like in two minutes and, and, and you just get with another one? There are so many things that are going to be changing in the next 
between five and 20 years, okay, mm -hmm. that, that will have huge influence on this. And, and when they begin to sell mobility as a service, will they want cars that are gonna be obsolete in six years? Eh? I don't believe so, okay? They wanna, gonna want their cars to run as long as possible, and you want the new technology, easy, 30 seconds, click, click, you got the new technology, your bill is now $10 more, okay? So, or $100 more, so whatever. Mm -hmm. So there are so many things, okay, that, that are in the process that will influence the answer to your question. But I think that it's very important to ask it. Because, it, because now they're making big decisions, okay, aligned to the current view of the world. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, and unfortunately the light's shining over there, but I wanted to ask a question to two young ladies who are sitting over there. I think they're from uh, Georgia Tech. Yeah. Uh, I want to, firstly, I want to make sure that they're not shy because I expect them to be, in a couple of years' time, the, the keynote speakers at our conferences <laughs> when they replace you guys in your positions. Uh, I just want to ask them, in a way, why are they here? Are you interested in, in automotive logistics or automotive... Are you interested in supply chain as a, as a future? If you're interested in supply chain or logistics, is automotive something that you're considering? Uh, and, and why, and what would you look for? Why would you, what would you look for in this kind of career? Because it's something we've been guessing that people like you want, but it'd be interesting to hear directly from you. So sorry to put the kind of spotlight on you, but if you're, like I said, if you're gonna be the keynote speakers at these kind of events, you've gotta get used to it. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, we are PhD students at Georgia Tech, working with Professor Benoit Montre in Physical Internet Lab in Georgia Tech. Actually, our research is on the physical internet concept, which is a very innovative concept for future supply chains. And so, I think it includes automotive like concepts as, as the inherent uh, concept behind the physical internet. And uh, I personally enjoy this environment because I'm seeing that what I'm learning and what I'm trying to show in like the academic environment, how it could be employed in industry and how the industry looks at these concepts. So I think these concepts are interesting to us in this aspect. And yeah, we are trying to like look what are the opportunities for us to be able to employ um, these big changes that Professor Bernard Monchet are mentioning uh, because I think this will be changing the world and uh, make the life easier for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so my name is Nayan Kim and I'm also working with Professor Bernard Montreux in the Georgia Tech. So if I add on top of what she just said, um, you talk about the customer expectation a lot, but I'm a student um, studying the supply chain, but at the same time, I'm a customer of Amazon or other e-commerce retailers as well. So maybe it's not directly related to the automotive industry itself, but if you look at the supply chain, um, then why would you not like having your product be delivered in a few hours with no additional cost? And if it costs too much to the companies, it doesn't make sense. I don't want to pay too much for that short, de like that delivery. But if we can achieve that without too much additional cost by collaborating, that's a very innovative idea, I think. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to say, if that's the future of automotive logistics, I think we're in good hands. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> So on that note, I think you know, it's time to wrap up. Uh, the good news for those of the young ladies, just think in 30 years' time, you'll look like this. <laughs> Lock the doors, don't make sure they don't escape. Uh, so uh, thank you very much to the panel for a very interesting discussion. Uh, it's been a, uh, this, this panel was a prime example of how the discussion's gone uh, over the two days. It was very forward-looking. Uh, the answers were thoughtful, 
uh, and came through very well. Uh, it, for me, it was you know the interaction from the 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 whole over the whole two days, even in the sessions. It, it wasn't like a conference. It was almost like being at home with my wife. I just had to say one word, and then the conversation would go for another 90 minutes. So it was uh, it was really good to hear how everyone was getting engaged in the conversations. Uh, I hope you liked uh, the, the slight different focus that we've had at this conference this year. We were a bit more forward looking. Uh, we weren't necessarily focusing on, as perhaps we've done in the past, what's happening today, what are today's solutions. We were trying to look at how the industry might, might change, what we need to do to make sure that the automotive supply chain and logistics is ready and relevant to support whatever the new automotive industry is. Uh, so it was a bit more thoughtful. It was about trying to understand people's requirements, people's mindsets, probably trying to change people's minds and ideas. So that's what this was about. So um, I, hope, I hope it worked. I hope, you know, I don't know if you were coming here saying, yeah, this was all theory and it was absolutely useless. So I hope that wasn't the case. Uh, and in fact, you know, again, at risk of being fired, uh, I'd like to do the red and green card thing. I'd like to ask, and, and be honest, you know, this is, you know, it was a kind of a, a chance, a risk that we took ourselves uh, to, to be a little bit more thought-provoking rather than specifically, uh, you know, uh, for today. So if you think the, the idea of looking forward was good and it worked and, and hopefully you liked the conference, please, the green card. If you didn't like it and thought it should have been more practical, then, then please raise the, the red cards. Thank you very much. So it's a very positive message, and I'd like to thank our team for hiding the red cards. Uh, that really works well, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and what we'd like to do uh, is to continue this discussion uh, at our conferences around the world, and particularly we've got our Automotive Logistics Global Conference coming up in Detroit in September, and we'd like to kind of move and continue this, uh, this theme and this, and this conversation forward in the conferences, but also in our magazines, online, on our, you know, social media, on LinkedIn. You know, for sure, Chris and his team uh, are always looking for ideas, uh, for topics, so please make sure you share, your, you share your ideas with us. People say, you know, how do we get in your magazine? Well, tell us. If you're doing something interesting, then tell us. We're, we're always looking for new ideas, but we want new ideas, we want content. So, uh, so please make sure, you know, our, our contact details are all over our website, probably in the, in the brochure somewhere, and, and Chris and I are very visible. If you can't, I'm Louis and he's Chris, I know we get a lot of confusion, we understand that. But I'm more the innovative hairstyle, as we, as we discussed before. Uh, uh, I, I think that the, the way people embraced uh, this forward-looking, the, the conversation was really good. Uh, uh, and was hopefully something that we can build on for the future. I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors who sponsored the conference knowing this was the direction was go uh, this conference was going. So it showed that they were you know, amongst the thoughtful, innovative companies. So of course our premier sponsor, a rider who sponsored, been our premier sponsors for, as I said before, I think 18 years now, but have changed with us, uh, or perhaps we've changed with them, and, and again embraced the the forward thinking. Uh, our first innovation sponsor, Serge, uh, who not only were sponsors, but uh, advised us and we worked with them closely as well and, and they helped us get a couple of the speakers, including uh, Deepinder from uh, 75F uh, and Electrolux. So they you know, really supported us well in their sponsorship. Our, uh, our gold sponsors, Evolution Time Critical, uh, and ProTrans, our global sponsors, Changju Logistics, CDC and CHEP, and our silver sponsors, CNW, Syncreon, and Venture. So there are companies who are forward-looking and forward-thinking. So it's the end of the conference now, but please visit their websites uh, and find out what they're doing and, uh, with a view to how they can help you. Uh, but most of all, I'd like to thank you for your participation and support. I hope you enjoyed the whole, the whole conference. And maybe it is good uh, you know, to finish off uh, with the two young ladies from Georgia Tech, you know, their explanation of why they were industry in the industry was fantastic and, and explains how I'm getting too old because I think, you know, before the explanation used to be, I like trucks. Uh, you know, to hear what they just explained, I mean, I'm, I'm going to actually have to Google that and understand most of the long words they were using. 
Uh, but as I said, you know, if the conference was, was supposed to be thought-provoking and forward-looking, you know, if we can, we have to fight to make sure we keep people like that in our industry. And if we can, then there's a great future ahead for automotive supply chain and logistics. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the great two days. Uh, before we finish off, though, uh, just on kind of what we've just discussed, you've, you should have the evaluation forms. They really are very important to us. So please complete them uh, and hand them in on your way out or, or we'll collect them. Because as I said, it's our second conference. In our own small way, we took a little of a, a bit of a risk in, in changing the, the concept and changing the discussions, topics. So please let us have your views. It's, it's your conference. We want to do what you want us to do. So please, we take those evaluation forms very seriously. Uh, so thank you very much for, the, for, the, uh, for your attendance, your participation. And Christopher and I would like to thank you and look forward to seeing you somewhere around the world, but at the very least in Detroit in September. So thank you very much, everybody.